This morning, what comes after the Trump trial? Democrats have a list of legislation they want to tackle. Congressman Al Green, a Houston Democrat, makes some bold predictions to us from D.C. A 3 a.m. tweet from a Texas school superintendent. This morning, she has a message for Governor Abbott and state lawmakers. National Republicans looking to challenge five Texas Democrats in Congress next year. We'll look at these districts and the likelihood of them flipping. State Rep. Victoria Niave in a new role at the Texas legislature, putting her in a better position to champion the bills that she wants. And remembering Representative Ron Wright, the Republican from Arlington, was the first person in Congress to die from COVID. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to our viewers across the state. Let's begin this frigid week with the top political headlines here in Texas. President Joe Biden campaigned on raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour. It's uncertain if that can pass in Congress right now, but whatever happens, Texas Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick says it is unlikely that this state will raise its own minimum wage beyond $7.25 an hour. That pay hasn't changed since 2009, and Patrick says raising it would likely cost jobs. COVID numbers have been going the right way in Texas. Governor Greg Abbott said if the downward trend continues, then he will lift some statewide restrictions soon. That likely means more people allowed inside restaurants and bars and movie theaters. And a tragic case in Dallas County that has stunned local Republicans in North Texas. A well-known conservative activist named Chris Dillard took his own life in the front yard of Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne's house. Dillard once worked on Van Dyne's campaign. Police in Irving said they do not yet know the reason why he did it. This morning, a question a lot of people are asking in Washington, D.C. What comes after the impeachment trial of Donald Trump? Democrats have a list of priorities, and Congressman Al Green, a Houston Democrat, had some bold predictions on some of them. We spoke to him from his office there at the U.S. Capitol. Congressman Green, good to see you again. Good to see you as well, my friend. You spent some time in the Senate chamber personally watching the uh, the second impeachment trial of, of uh, former President Donald Trump. Should Democrats have done anything differently? I don't think that there is very much that we could have done differently. There's always a desire to do better. And I think that you can uh, sometimes satiate that desire. But I think this time we did about all we could do. To be very honest with you, this is one of those circumstances wherein it's not just the president who's on trial. The truth is that the Senate is on trial. History will not be kind to the Senate. But as big as that is, there's still something even more lofty that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the country. We're dealing with a segment of our population that seems to believe that the election in somehow was rigged or was fraudulently perpetrated upon the people of the United States. We've got to deal with that. People need to believe that elections are free and fair in this country. And if we don't deal with that, this problem that we're dealing with now will still haunt us in the future. But, but Congressman, how do you deal with that when you have a, a, an echo chamber that, that some people like to be inside? How do you address that? You address it with truth. Uh, Carlisle is right. No lie can live forever. William Cullen Bryant is right. Truth crushed the earth shall rise again. We have to tell people the truth and we have to be persistent about it. And we have to engage our colleagues and ask them to be truthful as well. For example, in the media, we've had some, some persons who've distorted the truth. They've had liberties with uh, speaking truthfully. I think we have to just continue to be persistent about this and also interview people who were there. Let Republicans hear other Republicans talk about the elections. It's not over when the ballots are cast. We've got to make sure that people understand that the ballots were freely and fairly cast such that this was a good election. Legislatively, what comes next after impeachment? Now, a lot of Texans that we are hearing from want to know what in the world is going on with the stimulus. Well, we have to pass it. We made a commitment. People are expecting the $2,000 that we said we wanted to deliver. We've delivered on 600 of that. We have $1,400 more. My committee, the Financial Services Committee, is currently marking up legislation for about $75 billion. Uh, I have a portion of that will, will, that will deliver $10 billion to small businesses 
and very small businesses. President Biden has said that he's willing to uh, make some concessions to get bipartisan support. Do you think he should? Concessions can be made. It's capitulation that we have to concern ourselves with. I believe in having an opportunity to negotiate and both sides give and take, and that's fair. But when concessions become capitulation, then you're stepping on my principles, and I can't do this. I can only concede uh, so much. I think that there's probably room to negotiate, and there's probably room for us to make concessions, but you have to have a give and take on that point. And without both sides making concessions, it becomes capitulation for one side. That's unacceptable. I want to ask you about the, the minimum wage. It hasn't been raised, as so many people know, since 2009. Uh, and obviously, we hear this all the time. Some businesses say if it is doubled to $15 an hour, like President uh, Trump campaigned, uh, President Biden rather campaigned on, um, which is double what it is now, businesses have said that, that they might have to cut jobs. President Biden has now conceded that, that he might not be able to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Do you have any hope that it might actually be raised? Well, it will be. I say to you, without reservation, hesitation, or equivocation, it will be raised. Uh, it may not get raised right away. Uh, I'd like to do it immediately, if not sooner. And I, I want to do it because uh, this gets back to the rising tide, raising all boats. We raise the minimum wage. It impacts wages above the minimum wage. We want to raise it to $15 an hour. And personally, I'd like to see it indexed such that we won't have to do this every eight, 10 years, have this battle to raise the wage. I think it should be indexed to poverty. I have a bill, the Living American Wage Act, that does just this. We index the minimum wage to cop poverty such that anybody who works full time will always have a wage that's above the poverty line. People ought not work full time in the richest country in the world and live in poverty. Raise it, but index it is what I hope we'll do. But whether we index it or not, it will be raised because, quite frankly, it's happening around the country, and we will be paying catch up at some point, the federal government. Congressman, we always appreciate the time. Uh, my honor to always be with you, and God bless you, and please stay safe. All right, speaking of Congress, national Republicans are targeting five Democratic congressional seats in Texas next year. Al Green is not one of them, but Lizzie Fletcher there in Houston is. So is Colin Allred in Dallas, Vicente Gonzalez from McAllen, Henry Cuellar from Laredo, and Philemon Vela from Brownsville. What are the chances, though? Let's ask Ross Ramsey, the co-founder and executive editor of the Texas Tribune. Good morning to you, Ross. Good morning, Jason. How are you? Doing well here. You know, the, the GOP is really going after seats along the uh, Texas-Mexico border. Donald Trump won, what, 14 counties there last November, but isn't it still solid blue? It's not as solid as they thought it was. They had some uh, glimmers of light in this last election. You know, Trump did better than Republicans ordinarily do in several of those counties. Uh, redistricting is coming up, so there's a chance to redraw lines and maybe draw some Republicans in and draw some Democrats out, they might have a chance down there. Uh, let's talk about Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick. He was in the news uh, a few days ago as well, saying he'll make it a priority to require the national anthem, anthem rather, the Star Spangled Banner uh, at all major events that receive public funding. And he also said gambling bills are DOA in the Senate. You know, one of these things is really substantive, and that's probably the gambling thing. Uh, <laughs> the state looked like it was going to be in bad budget shape, and so people started talking about people in Austin, I mean, started talking about gambling and marijuana, partly to get those things in and partly to get some money. The budget looks better than it did. They don't need the money. Patrick says they don't need the gambling. Wow. All right, Ross, back to you in a moment. Thank you. Coming up, State Representative Victoria Niave, a Dallas Democrat with a new rare role and a new title at the state capitol. And a tweet in the middle of the night from a school superintendent. That's what a lot of her colleagues are saying as well. She's with us when we return. You're watching Inside Texas Politics. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Our latest podcast is all about hair. Not my co-host Jason Wheeler's always perfectly styled do, but natural hair. Black women saying enough with the discrimination over how they wear their hair, arguing that their professionalism should not be judged over the way their hair grows out of their head. 
But the issue goes deeper than that, and it's the purpose of the Crown Act, a bill that Texas lawmakers will consider this session. This is an enlightening conversation. It was for us, and it is the latest episode of our political podcast called Yolitics. You can listen to it this morning. If your phone is handy, turn on the camera there, point it at the QR code on the right side of your screen. It will take you directly to this latest episode. And remember, new episodes of Yolitics drop every Tuesday. Let's stay in Austin this morning where women lawmakers in the Texas House are at least serving in high profile positions. Five women appointed to chair committees deciding what legislation advances and which ones do not. One woman with a gavel now is State Rep Victoria Niave, a Dallas Democrat, and she is with us from her district in Dallas this morning. Good morning to you and congratulations. Good morning. Thank you so much. I'm just really, really honored about this opportunity to lead on issues that are so, so important to the state of I, Texas, I specifically the children and families. Yeah, I want to get into that. I should have addressed you as Madam Chair. My apologies for that, Madam Chair. <laughs> let's let's uh, get into this for a moment here because you were just appointed chair of the House Committee on Juvenile Justice and Family Issues. I, this is striking to me in Texas. You're only the sixth Latina to chair a, uh, a committee in the Texas House, which is stunning to me. Had you been lobbying for this or did you just get a phone call from Speaker uh, Phelan? We've been working hard and I will say the very first woman was Ima Rangel, who we know we have an amazing school right here in Dallas named after her. And um, as we strive for equity and to highlight um, you know, put a spotlight on issues that disproportionately impact women in Texas. I'm just really thrilled that the speaker um, had the faith and trusted me to lead on these really important issues for Texas women and children. And for people who might not follow the, the legislature, maybe at a granular level, committee chairs really have a lot of influence and a lot of sway over what bills pass through committee and get onto the House floor. So with that in mind, Madam Chair, what are your priorities for this session? That's correct, and thank you so much. We we saw during the pandemic a significant increase in domestic violence right here in Dallas and in, all across uh, different parts of Texas. So that is something that we absolutely want to prioritize. We want to make sure that our rape crisis centers and our family violence centers that have providing been providing such necessary uh, resources to individuals who are trying to you know, escape abuse or perpetrators that they have the tools that they need to be able to continue to serve our community. Uh, you know, we know that the budget is a big um, issue, so we've got to make sure that they continue to get those resources. But we want to continue our work with respect to uh, sexual assaults as well. And also as a chair of the juvenile justice and family issues, one of the other deep dives that we're going to be doing is looking at the school to prison pipeline, for example, the disproportionate impact on students of color as well. And so there's just a broad swath of um, topics that we'll be focusing and doing a deep dive on. And we want to make sure that the bills that come out of our committee are bipartisan, that they um, really accomplish something meaningful for the state of Texas so that yeah. we can help uh, children and families right here. Well, ever since being elected in 2017, you've really uh, pushed for uh, the testing of rape kits that have sometimes just been sitting in evidence rooms, which is remarkable police departments all across the state. You got the Lavinia Masters Act passed, which requires the testing of rape kits. In the, in the final moments here, too, you want to strengthen that this session. Tell me what, what that would look like. Yes, the Lavinia Masters Act was historic. It was unprecedented. It has completely transformed the justice system for rape survivors and uh, had an unprecedented $50 million. So um, I just met with DPS again this week and we're thrilled about the progress of the legislation. So we'll be rolling out very soon our legislative package um, to address additional issues so that we make sure that not one rape kit uh, goes untested and so that survivors get the justice that they deserve. All right, sounds good, we'll be following that. Congratulations again, uh, uh, State Rep Victoria Niave, the uh, new chair of the House Committee on uh, Family Issues and Juvenile Justice. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much, thank you for the invite. Now to that tweet. In the middle of the night, Dr. Jeannie Stone, the superintendent of Richardson ISD, sent it the other day at 3.48 a.m. Schools have been open for 100 days, she wrote, but Texas teachers cannot yet get the COVID vaccine. She's right. 27 states have made teachers eligible, not Texas, though. Richardson ISD is made up of 38,000 students in Northeast Dallas County, and Dr. Jeannie Stone got on a video call with us to talk about this issue that is frustrating school leaders like her all across the state. 
Dr. Stone, thanks for the time. T- tell us about this tweet. You, you were up in, in the middle of the night to send this out. What specifically kept you up? Well, I'm up a lot of nights, it seems, um, in, in the spring of 2020 and into this school year. But um, it really was, I, I, I was losing sleep um, because I have a concern for my students and my staff members related to COVID. And uh, that particular night, I was um, grieving the loss with one of my employees who had lost uh, her father. And um, it was, it, it just really made me think about and bring to light in my own mind some frustrations that I have about the fact that teachers are still educators, all of our frontline workers, cafeteria, bus drivers, are not on a priority list yet for the vaccine. Dr. Stone, what's your message to uh, the governor or to state lawmakers who might be watching this program? You know, I think it's that thank you for the job that you do to serve our state. Um, I want there to be a recognition that um, we are doing our part as educators to keep our schools open, which is so important to the state and to the economy. But our teachers deserve to be the priority on a priority list that's coming up. And um, we just need that consideration because they're our heroes. Every educator doing our part is our hero, is a hero. And um, the vaccine is another layer of safety that would allow us and them, all of them, to keep doing their jobs. And we asked the governor about this, and Governor Abbott said he is following CDC guidelines uh, as far as who gets the vaccine first. Is, is that enough or should the state itself step in and, and overrule that? Well, I, you know, I, I didn't know until I had put the tweet out that um, that I believe 27 other states have put their teachers on uh, the priority list and they're getting vaccinated. So, you know, I, I just want there to be on the next list, be that 1C or 2A or whatever the next priority list list is, that there is a recognition that teachers deserve to be on it. All right. Dr. Stone, hope you get some sleep. We appreciate the time. Appreciate you. Thank you. When we come back this morning, remembering Representative Ron Wright, the first person in Congress to die from COVID, a former guest on this program. He was from North Texas, and we'll begin with his legacy next on The Roundtable. This is Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. Ross is back with us. Bud Kennedy is here from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. And Bernadine Steptoe, political producer at WFAA in Dallas, joins us each week as well. And uh, Bud, let's start with you this week. Congressman Ron Wright, he passed away uh, from COVID. He had been battling cancer as well. He is a Republican representing uh, part of Tarrant County, where you are. Ellis County and Navarro County as well in North Texas. What is he remembered for? You know, Ron was a Freedom Caucus Republican. Uh, He was a little more conservative than Joe Barton, his old boss. He was Joe's chief of staff. Uh, But he was also a nice guy. He was easy to get along with, answered people's questions, made friends. Uh, You know, he wasn't mean to people. What he's known for across the Metroplex is that, you know, he could have been the Tea Party conservative who nixed the idea of bringing the Cowboys to Arlington, but he went along with the idea of building the stadium. He could have spoken out and stopped it, but he let him, he let the Cowboys come to Arlington. A little known political fact there. Uh, Ross, it's up to the governor, I guess, to uh, call a special election in this seat. He doesn't appoint anyone, right? That's only for Senate. Right, uh, so they'll call a special election. I expect him to get a crowd running for this seat, and it's gonna be one of the first tests in Texas of whether or not uh, the former president gets involved in a race, whether the former president's followers get involved in an organized way. I think it's going to be an interesting piece of politics. Yeah, indeed. So I would I'm already hearing quite a few names, Bernadine. I would expect a huge crowd as well, too. But any chance that this district flips from Republican to Democrat or is it still solid uh, GOP? You know what? It, it There's a possibility. I know that former Congressman Wright only won the seat by what, three percentage points. Uh, But it's going to be an interesting race, as we've all said, and there's going to be a lot of people who jump into it. But we'll see. But I know that it it is uh, somewhat declared as a swing state because I think Uh, President, uh, former President Trump only won it by three percent. Yeah, a swing seat, a swing seat, not a swing state. Yeah, we've talked a lot about swing. swing, This being a swing state, which it hasn't uh, become yet, too. But yeah, like 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 you guys have said, I I fully expect quite a few people, especially Republicans, uh, likely running for this. But let's uh, shift off and and talk about uh, what took up all the all all the 
air in the room the other day or last week rather the impeachment trial Ross it seemed to get most of the attention but uh, in Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton had some uh, pretty tough questions from state senators. Yeah, the Senate laid into him a little bit about uh, $40 million that came from a settlement that sort of went into his agency's accounts without going through the state appropriations uh, process. The legislators who write the budget don't like that a bit, and they let him know. He's a former colleague. It was kind of interesting to see his former colleagues in the Senate go after him, but go after him they did. Yeah, indeed so, Bud. Is this just like a, a blip on the radar screen, or, or do you see any uh, you know, tactical move that lawmakers are going to be making against him? This is a pretty big wind shift. You know, the, yeah. it was easy to kind of disregard the, the charges against him because nobody had ever been charged with that, uh, with that business crime before. He, he'd already actually paid a, a civil settlement. So uh, nobody had ever faced that charge. People could say, well, this is political. But, you know, now it's starting to look like the, 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 his fellow Republicans are getting upset. Uh, there is an, an ongoing expanding FBI investigation. And I think that, that the Republicans have started to turn on Ken. Wow, and Bernadine, you're uh, in agreement there. Yes, I am. And it is about time because he's done so much that uh, that the Republican Party has, and his colleagues has just allowed him to do. But it's about time that they question some of his actions. And Ross, back to you briefly here, too. He, he's up for election next year, up for re-election next year, which I presume he's going to run again. Um, real quick, do you think, does this impact anything with that? Yeah. Yeah, we're on the doorstep. You know, I don't I know most people don't want to think about it, but we're on the doorstep of the 2022 elections. Yeah. A lot of statewide office holders who aren't governors are thinking about being governors and things like that. Paxton's distracted and perhaps vulnerable to other people. Wow. A lot to watch for. Guys, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Thank you for watching as well. We're back again next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics. Hope you can join us then. Take care.